Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Zev from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I've come down to see friend and talented maker, Nick McMillan. Nick, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Nice to see you. So, if you've been watching my channel for some time, you will be familiar with Nick where we filmed a previous series on processing and weaving a bar, uh, bark basket made from cedar. Now, on this return visit to see Nick, what we're going to be looking at is Nick's entire process for making a basket from sweet chestnut. We're gonna be starting off from literally a raw piece of sweet chestnut, processing it all the way through with all the nuances along the way, and all the way to actually making a basket and finishing the basket. Now, a few things to mention at the very beginning of this video. Number one, as you can see, this is a very lengthy video. That's because there is a lot of steps involved in making this type of basket. So to, in order to facilitate this, making it easier for you as you're watching, what we've done, we've broken this video into all the different sections and chapters. So if you scroll along the timeline of this video on YouTube, you can see all the different sections marked out, but also in the description below this video, you can see all the sections marked out chronologically. On the left-hand side, you will see the times relating to what parts of the video they are. And YouTube is a very cool feature. If you click on that number, that is listed there on the left hand side, it will jump straight to that particular part of the video. Secondly, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put links below to the previous series that I've filmed with Nick. I would highly recommend you go check those out. They also break down the entire process in detail, how we made that particular type of basket. What I'm also gonna do is put links below to Nick's website and his Instagram, because what Nick has actually done is published a book that accompanies the entire process that he's gonna be outlining in this video. And don't worry, we will be talking about the book shortly. And so, like I said, this is a very long video, but like I said, Nick is leaving no stone unturned. So what we're gonna do first and foremost is we're actually gonna look at an example basket so you can get a better idea of the kind of basket Nick is hoping to achieve throughout this entire video. Then we're gonna actually look at the processing of the wood itself and all the nuances along the way. And then once again, we're gonna go through the entire process all the way to a finished basket. So Nick, with your kind permission, shall we begin? Yeah, let's do it. So guys, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. So Nick, I think it's important to mention whereabouts in the country we're filming. Uh, so we're in uh, some chestnut coppice woodland uh, that my friend owns down in uh, East Sussex in the UK. So that's in the southeast of England, basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of the basket, is this kind of a finished example of what you're hoping to show in this video? Yeah, um, this is what we're going to take, um, show you how to make from tree to this uh, over the course of the video. Uh, it's loosely based on a, a American shaker basket uh, from the kind of Appalachian Mountains, which would have been made from pounded ash. Um, I've taken that kind of um, design and just tweaked it a little bit um, just to use the sweet chestnut bark. The, the bark's similar to pounded ash in that it's a, a flat weaving material, it's not a round weaving material, so it sort of lends itself to a similar sort of designer basket as the, the pounded ash. Um, and yeah, it's going to be, it's a, it's a kind of a little foraging basket, so you could gather your mushrooms or autumn berries or um, spring greens, stuff like that. In it. So you've got the base, you've got the size, and then you've got the, the top rim, haven't you? Yeah, so I mean the process for making the basket is going to be uh, making the base, weave the sides, and then we're going to fit the handle, which is um, going to be uh, like a steam bent handle, which we'll show you how to make. Uh, it's a very simple kind of hand handle. That's fitted in, and then we, we weave, uh, weave the border uh, around there, which actually sort of you know, secures the handle to the basket as well. Um, and also, just one thing to briefly touch on, if people have not watched the previous videos that we did, mm. but just kind of briefly touching on your background as an outdoorsman, as a maker, would you like to talk a little bit about that? So uh, I started uh, kind of in the outdoor industry, uh, sort of early 2000s. Um, I did a instructor's course with a guy called John Ryder from Woodcraft School and ended up working for him for sort of five, six years, uh, teaching outdoor living skills, uh, bow making, basketry. Um, met my wife on a course there 
Uh, we subsequently got married, had kids, set up our own business, uh, which she still runs called the Field Farm Project, uh, which we ran for 10 years up until the start of COVID. Um, since then, I've become a full-time artist and craftsman. Um, I'm a botanical illustrator and um, basket maker. Excellent. So, to begin the process, um, we're also going to now just walk over to a kind of piece of chestnut that mm -hmm. you just freshly felled and talk mm -hmm. about that. And then from there, uh, that's it. We'll begin the rest of the process. Yeah. So Nick, before we delve into the actual processing of the material itself for the baskets, it's important that we talk about kind of two things tied into one. Number one, how you're sourcing your material for this particular project, and also for those that are watching, what they should and shouldn't do themselves. So firstly, talking about how you're sourcing the material in a responsible way. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've um, had a relationship with the landowner of this wood uh, quite a long time now. Uh, we're good mates and he's very kindly uh, let me take down this chestnut stem. Um, it's cut out of season, um, so chestnut coppice would normally be cut in the winter over the dormant period of the tree's growth and, um, and then in the spring you get all the re regrowth and that goes on, grows on to become the new, um, sort of the new crop. Um, to harvest bark, uh, you need to fell the tree when the sap's rising. So that's sort of uh, mid to late spring, early summer, uh, which is out of the normal coppice sort of rotation season. So uh, it is important that you get the landowner's permission that they're okay with you doing this. Um, now I'm only taking one stem. Uh, I'm not felling loads of, loads of coppice here. So I've just taken one piece of chestnut off a coppice stool, um, which in the grand scheme of things is okay. This is a big, big uh, coppice woodland, so just taking one stem out of season isn't a problem. Um, it is really important to get the landowner's permission. You can't just walk into any old woodland and, and start knocking trees down. Uh, you're gonna get into trouble and just become unpopular. Um, I have found that by um, meeting landowners and explaining what you're trying to do and what you'd like to do, um, they're usually actually sort of really interested um, not many people know about sweet chestnut bark as a, a weaving material so they're generally kind of quite intrigued and um, probably be really helpful and, and, and more than happy for you to just take one stem um, and then you know they'll be really intrigued to see the finished finished product so yeah it's, it's important to build those relationships with landowners and not go around just knocking trees over and annoying annoying people it's not the way to do it and also, I think something we spoke about off camera is that the, how chestnut is historically been used in the southeast of England as a coppice. Yeah, so it's not native to England. Uh, it's native to the north of uh, northern Mediterranean, kind of Spain through to Turkey. Uh, it was the Romans that brought it over to England uh, for, as a food source from the nuts and as a building material. Uh, it's a very, very good uh, wood for timber framing. Uh, it's for, once the bark's off, it's very weather resistant, uh, so it lasts really well outside. And, and then since then, it's been grown as a coppice, so the tree is cut and it shoots up loads of new stems, and you can keep doing that and keep harvesting those stems on a rotation, depending on what sort of uh, product you want as to how long you grow the tree and how big you want it. Um, and then you keep cutting it and it will just keep growing. Um, and these coppice, stool, school, coppice stools can be hundreds of years old. Um, and yeah, it's a really big industry in the sort of southeast of England, all the way through the Weald from kind of Winchester, all the way through uh, Sussex uh, and into Kent. Um, there's a lot of chestnut coppice. And it's a big industry for charcoal, um, split rail fencing, timber frame houses, uh, chestnut paling fencing, um, furniture, yeah, all sorts of stuff. So coming back to the project at hand in this video, um, so with this particular piece that's been kind of responsibly felt, 
Um, what are some pointers that you're looking for uh, in terms of the diameter, et cetera, for the project that you've got in mind? When we're looking at uh, a tree for harvesting the bark for weaving, uh, usually the bark's kind of a waste, waste material uh, for coppice workers. But for us, I'm looking for something very straight, uh, hardly any side branches, uh, and just a nice clean stem. And also this sort of smooth bark I want. It, when, when the tree starts getting a bit older and a bit bigger, it starts getting lots of fissures in the bark. Uh, and you might see on these other sort of uh, stems around the coppice, certainly this one here, you can see the bark started to get quite fissured. Uh, that's not really good uh, for what we want. Uh, it can actually sort of make the inner bark um, kind of have tears in it. So we're after this nice, clean, grey, smooth bark. Um, this stem's okay, this lower bit. It starts getting a bit uh, unusable further up, but that's kind of good. It shows stuff that we're not after. So you can see this piece here. Uh, this is where the tree's been rubbing against another stem. And the bark here is going to be really difficult to get off. So all this section here will be unusable. Um, we've also got you know, big branch union there, which is going to be, they're always sort of cause problems with the inner bark. And then as we get further up onto some other pieces, they're quite twisty. Um, so it's going to be mainly this bottom section that we're going to be after. If you, you know, you look around and it's really well managed, um, good chestnut coppice, you can usually find a stem that, you know, you, you're getting the bark off the whole lot. So just one stem, if you're quite picky and get something really good, you can get a lot of material um, just off one stem that will keep, you, you know, make loads and loads of baskets. You don't need to fell loads of stems. Um, yeah. So what do you do to begin the process? So to start with, um, I've just cut this up into a kind of manageable length, about six, seven foot, because um, I'm going to need to turn, the, turn this log over because um, I want to get to all sides of it. I'm going to start by scraping the outer bark off. Now we don't want the outer bark on our, uh, on our weaving material. So when it dries, it goes kind of woody and it breaks. It's not, it, it, it stops the bark being supple. By removing that, we're just left with this cream coloured inner bark. Um, and that, that will dry rigid, but when we re-wet it, it becomes supple again and it will bend, it will fold quite nicely. So the first process is to scrape off this outer bark. It's really thin. Uh, you can see it's very thin layer there. Just with my fingernail, you can get down through it. So what I'm going to use is just a Laplander. Um, I'm just going to use the back of the blade as a scraper, basically. Um, any kind of blunt metal um, sort of edge will work, you know, the edge of a sort of one foot ruler, metal ruler or something like that. We don't want to cut the inner bark here. All I'd want to do is scrape it. So I'm just going to start up near the top here and just scrape down. You can see we get some tough, tough areas. I can just come in and scrape those off like that. Put this area here. I can just rotate it more. And this is where the fact that you're harvesting this when there's still a little bit of sap is making it easier, isn't it? Yeah, if you um, try and peel bark out of sort of spring or early summer when the sap's not rising, it's going to stick to the wood inside. Um, because the sap's rising, it's kind of, uh, there's a, you know, it's creating a sort of gap between those two surfaces and it peels nice and easily. You'll see when we actually cut this bark off the tree um, it will come off really easily if you do it sort of late summer autumn winter you, you're just going to shred the bark trying to get it off the log uh, it won't come off easily there's no point sort of doing it that time of year really
down. So this here, that's a bit of a dodgy area. You can sort of see the bark's not coming off very well. I think we'll have problems sort of peeling that area, uh, but we can cut around it. If you're only making a little basket like we are, you know, the longest piece of bark we're using, probably just under three foot, it's about 30 inches, something like that. So, you know, you don't need a six, seven foot log. If you've got problem areas, just cut around them, uh, make your bark smaller. Obviously, if you're making something a bit bigger, you might need the longer material. So Nick, how are you getting on? Okay, we've uh, scraped off the top layer, the outer bark on uh, this section here. Uh, if we look around the underside here, just having real trouble getting the outer bark off. Um, and yeah, it's almost like this side has kind of fused to the wood. Uh, the sap's not rising up through this bit. I don't know why environmental conditions, uh, the way it's grown, the way it's, you know, the local environment, whatever. Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna bother peeling this section here. Um, if the outer bark's not coming off easily, then there's no point peeling it. You're just gonna throw it away anyway. But I have peeled, scraped a nice big portion here, which, you know, is a big usable piece of bark. So, a few things I've done to start with is I've just made a very simple tool. Uh, it's called a spud. I don't know why it's called a spud, uh, but it's basically just a stick uh, tapered to a point. Um, and that I'm going to use to help just pry the bark away from the log to start with. And then I can kind of get my fingers in. Just allows for that first little, little foray into the bark. Um, so I'm going to take a knife and I'm just going to score down this side just on the outside of this bit we're tr struggling with and then I'm going to do the same on the other side and I'll just cut around there and we'll take that section off so when I'm using the knife obviously I don't want to be cutting into my legs there so I'm just going to cut to the side of my body It's a case of just running the knife down like that. Just... How, how deep are you going roughly? Uh, it's, it, I mean, it depends on the size of the tree. The thicker, the, the bigger the tree, the thicker the bark will be. But you know, it's probably mil, two mil. It's not that deep. Uh, it's quite easy to cut chestnut bark. Just turn it over, do this side. And then I'm just going to cut around here to join those two cuts up. You can kind of hear those fibres breaking. I'm just going to start on one of these corners up here and just get that in there and I'm just going to run the spud down this split don't start peeling it around there just work from the split all the way along and just work it back and then when it's open you can kind of get your fingers in and just start working it. Might come up some tough spots. And we'll just use the spud again. So I'm just trying to gently sort of lever it away from the wood. I want to be careful not to kind of 
be too ferocious here and actually sort of split the out, split the bark, damage it. It's very pleasing doing this. It's always uh, when I teach uh, bark work. It's so always this kind of initial peeling bit. It's just a real wow factor for people. They're just like, oh my God, this is awesome. I was out at the weekend teaching some people cedar bark and uh, there's one guy there had no real preconceptions about what was involved, what was gonna happen. And we've got a nice big log and we peeled a huge great sheet off this one log and he was just blown away. And it's just like, wow, this is, this is really awesome. And it is, it's quite, a, what a cool thing to do. So up here, we've got this little knot here. So that's just where a little branch has come out. So that's gonna be a little bit of a problem area. So just wanna be careful around that. It's coming around to the other side now. There we go. So we've peeled off a sheet there. You can kind of see the moisture in it. I don't know if you can catch that in the sunlight. Yeah, that's all the sap traveling up and down the tree, um, which acts as the lubricant to kind of get this outer bark, this inner bark off. And you can see that's quite thick. That's what, two, three mil? Uh, so that's quite a nice piece of bark, that. You'll probably get a couple of the baskets we're gonna make out of that. Oh wow, so that will make a good couple of baskets. Yeah, so what we're going to do, we'll, we'll split this thickness down. So we're not going to use the bark when it's this thick. We're going to actually sort of peel those layers, separate it down. Uh, once it's dried, uh, that might even peel down to a couple of times. So you're kind of almost quadrupling the material that you've got. Uh, so that's good. So now, now that I've peeled the bark off, off the tree, if I just leave it to dry like that, uh, what's going to happen? It's going to roll up like a piece of guttering and then you know it's going to be really difficult to sort of re-soak this uh, what i want to do is sort of roll it up so uh, it's going to kind of stay flat almost so we found the best way to do that is just with the outside of the bark on the inside of our roll it's going to roll it up like so and then I'll just tie that off or wedge it in a tree or something and leave it to dry like that. And that way it stays flat. Um, reason why we want to dry our bark before we weave with it is because this is loaded with moisture and it, it, it's, it's sort of swelled. Uh, as it dries, it's going to shrink. So it's going to shrink across its width and across its depth. The length won't change much. But what that means for our basket is if we've woven with this material as it is, as that material shrinks, the basket's gonna become, become really loose and saggy, um, which yeah, it, it's just gonna render the basket pretty, pretty useless. So we need to fully dry this material first. That's probably gonna take, I don't know, a couple of days in this weather, it's quite hot here. Um, and yeah, once it's completely dry, then you can kind of store it indefinitely. As long as you keep it dry, it will store for years. Um, we've got bark we've had for you know three four five years since before covid uh, as long as you keep it dry it, it's still usable when you come to use it again you then run it through hot water which we'll show you in a bit and that kind of softens the bark down again um, and then it makes it flexible and usable so that's what i'm going to do now just one final question i have for you is and this is kind of like branching out a little bit, excuse the pun, no. um, from, from what you've just done here. But for example, now you've got this remaining piece of chestnut mm -hmm. on the floor. Is that then typically used for other projects, other, other, other things? Other... Well, I'm going to uh, probably take this section here uh, and I'm going to make our handle for our basket out of this, um, split wood handle. Now, obviously, the handle we're going to make is probably that long, about that wide and probably about that thin. So it's a very small piece of wood from this large piece of wood. Uh, but yeah, you can split it out and just create loads of blanks for loads of handles. Um, I generally firewood chestnut. Uh, that's why it goes on the stove at home. 
Um, the guy that owns this woodland, he charcoals it. So anything we don't use will go into the charcoal burner and uh, he'll sell that on this charcoal. But that's obviously a big, uh, um, I can't put it, a big aspect of coppicing, isn't it? That you're using as much as you can. Yeah, so every kind of part of the tree almost has a, has a use. Um, this stuff is, is quite big. Um, Mark's got a felling license for a certain amount of it. Um, he doesn't sell the firewood, but he will charcoal it. Um, I think this sort of stuff, maybe a bit bigger, uh, those two stems at the back there, you could use for timber framing. Uh, the smaller stuff you can like use to make trugs and screens. Um, so yeah, every, every sort of stage of chestnut coppice kind of has a use for it. People have found a way of you know, utilising that, that, that coppice to make a product to sell and earn a living from. So Nick, what's next in the process? Okay, we've got our um, bit that we've just peeled here. Um, I'm just coiled it up. I'm just gonna leave it in there to dry. Um, as we said, we wanna dry it fully first before we then come to use the bark because it'll shrink. Here's some that I harvested quite a few years ago. Uh, nice big stem. We've got a nice big coil of bark here. Uh, we dried this and then this has just been uh, in my wife's workshop since then really just keeping it dry you can see these black spots here uh, this is where it's got a little bit damp uh, i think when we harvested this we left it out on the lawn overnight um, just because we, we we didn't bring it in and you can see where it's just been sitting on the wet ground it's just started to get a little bit moldy uh, so best practice really is when you're drying your bark uh, bring it in at night and you know if you're out camping in the woods just hang it up on the guideline off the ground uh, and then you won't get this, these black spots, this mold. Um, so yeah, this is our fully dried bark. It's gonna store indefinitely as long as we keep it dry, but to uh, weave our basket, we now have to soak it uh, to rehydrate it, to get it flexible again. Uh, the important thing with re-soaking it is we don't wanna soak it so much that it's gonna bloat and then it will shrink again when it dries. So we'll have that problem with our basket getting all loose and baggy. We want to soak it just enough so it's flexible and workable, but it's not going to shrink loads. So it's the kind of um, like a fine balance between those two, those two needs really. We want it flexible, but we don't want it over soaked. Um, what I've got is just some hot water on the fire. Uh, you can soak it in cold water, but I've found hot water just sort of, it, it's quicker. It seems to penetrate the bark um, quicker. Uh, I've got a, a thinner strip here, which is going to fit into our jam pot. If you have got a big roll like this, um, you know, that's quite a big container. You need to soak that in. So you may want to just take a knife and cut those into strips, thinner strips like this. And then we're just going to pop that in the hot water. And I'll leave that for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes if it's really hot water. Um, keep an eye on it, then take it out. If it still feels quite brittle or it's not going to bend, it still feels quite rigid, just pop it back in for another five minutes. When you take it out, uh, it's best to kind of leave it to sit for sort of 10, five, 10 minutes. Uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's called mellowing. It's something they do in willow weaving. They won't just weave straight away with uh, soaked willow. They'll leave it for a time. And what that's doing, it's allowing that moisture, the water to sort of penetrate right to the center of the bark. Uh, so just leave it for five, 10 minutes, let it mellow, let that water carry on penetrate into the middle uh, and then it's usable. And then we're going to cut it into strips and uh, I'll show you that process next. So while we wait for that to soak, I thought it would be a great opportunity to take a moment and talk about the book that you've written to accompany this video. So what was the inspiration behind the book? Um, there's not a huge amount out uh, there about weaving sweet chestnut bark. It's sort of touched on in uh, a few like bushcraft books. Uh, I think John Ryder mentions it is in his, which is a sort of celebration of trees, his book. 
uh, that might be a bit in Ray's essential bushcraft. Um, but yeah, there's no, no one's really sort of talked about it on its own as its own sort of subject. So I just wanted to use this basket here as a way of just talking about uh, chestnut bark, going through harvesting, um, you know, the, the techniques we've seen, um, and then how to process it, how to store it, uh, and then how to convert that into a weaving material. Um, then there's a project at the book to make this basket, which will take you through the whole process, uh, including making the um, steam bend in the handle as well. And you've done the illustrations yourself as well, haven't you? I have, yep. Yeah. Um, I I've got a I've I've got quite a lot of books from you know the sort of early twentieth century, um, Wildwood Wisdom, uh, Cash Lake Country, all those kind of books, and they're all beautifully illustrated with pen and ink drawings. Um, and I don't know, there's something about a pen and ink drawing that just kind of fits this sort of stuff. Um, also, I don't think photographs work very well with basketry illustrations and demonstrating how to weave baskets. Uh, photos seem to sort of, you know, there's too much clutter in a photo. It's sort of difficult to see what you're actually trying to get at. Uh, I think with a drawing, you can sort of pinpoint what you're actually trying to say uh, with, the, with the instructions a lot, clear, a lot, more, a lot more clearly. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, it's gonna be fully illustrated. Um, all the techniques we talked about, uh, coppicing, um, all the sort of preparing, peeling, all that sort of stuff, and then all the instructions for how to um, turn that bark into the basket. And it's going to be available as a downloadable ebook, is that correct? It is. It will be available from our website, uh, which is uh, macmillanart.co.uk, and it will be available as a downloadable PDF. And do you feel then, just to kind of wrap up, that this will be this book will be a great accompaniment to this video that people are watching. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know I've learned a lot of my techniques from books. Uh, there's a couple of books, Earth Basketry, Cedar by Hilary Stewart. Uh, and you kind of can't beat having a book there, open at the page on the technique you need. Um, it, just, it just works really well, yeah. So what I'll do guys, needless to say, I will link to that below in the description and pinned to the top of the comments. And if you gain any value from this video, then the book will be a fantastic accompaniment. Thank you for talking us through that, Nick. You're welcome. So how are we looking with the piece that's been drying off? It's looking good. Uh, it's nice and uh, supple. Uh, it's bending well. Um, it's fully mellowed, so we know the moisture's got nice and penetrated through to the middle of the bark. Um, now what I need to do is cut it into strips. Now there's a few different ways you can do this. You can use a pair of scissors, nice sharp scissors, and just individually cut your strips off. Uh, you could use a steel ruler and a scalpel or a you know, craft knife, something like that. Um, I have seen, and I've done it myself, I've uh, got um, blocks of wood and then got razor blades and sort of sandwiched them in between loads of wood, bolted those together to get a kind of, almost like a bear claw. Then you can sort of run that down, down the strip of wood to cut lots of um, strips at the same time. Um, what I've got here is uh, from a company called Tandy Leather. Uh, it's for cutting strips of leather. Um, and it basically works, you know, you've got uh, different razor blades here. You can set them at different widths. Because uh, it's American, it's imperial. Uh, so these, each one of these little plastic dividers is um, an eighth of an inch. So I've set mine at half inch, the width of the, the cutters. And that's what we're gonna do. Cut that to sort of half inch strips and then I'll show you how to uh, split the thickness down. So just before you actually uh, mm. kind of cut this down, um, in terms of the width that you cut the strips, is that all depending on the project you're going to be making? Yeah, the basket I've, uh, we're gonna make, uh, which is featured in the book, uh, it's all um, using half inch strips. I think there's one three quarter inch strip, which I'll talk about. And then there's a couple which uh, go around the rim, which are five eighths. Um, I tend to work in Imperial 
for a lot of my woodworking, bow making and stuff is all Imperial. Um, I have put in the book the metric c conversions. So, you know, uh, what's, what's half, a, half an inch is 12 mil, something like that. But um, I just find inches easier to work um, in this sort of stuff. So we've got our cutter here. I've got a nice clean edge down here. So I'm going to use that as the edge on there. And I'm just going to embed, you can see the blade sticking up through there. And then we just pull it through. And very quickly, we can get loads of strips cut. If you're doing a big project, uh, these are a real game changer. Um, you're cutting all this by hand with a, a ruler and a scalpel is quite laborious. So we've got nice long strips, all even. I'm just going to use a knife to cut these ends. There we go. So I'll just cut these three. Now I'm going to take them over to our seat and I'll show you how to uh, split down the thickness of the bark. So here I've got the material that we want to end up with. Uh, it's a lot thinner. Uh, you can see then this, this bark that we've just cut. Um, you could make a basket with this stuff here, but um, it would be quite coarse. Uh, it's quite difficult to get a nice tight weave when the bark's really thick. So what I want to do is just split this thickness down by peeling it. Um, what that's, you know, the benefit of that is we're doubling our usable material. So I'll take one of these strips. Just going to clean the end off. So I've got a nice clean end there, and you can see that's quite thick. Then, using a knife, nice and carefully, just going to gently prise that in there. Okay, I'm not putting a load of pressure on here, so no danger of cutting my hands. I'm just separating those layers just by waggling it. You can see those two layers have started separating. Now, I'll clamp it in my knees. And then these two fingers are going to press against the bark there and stop that split running right down. So I've always got control. And then I'm just going to peel each side depending on the thickness or where the split's going. Now, when you're splitting timber or bark like this, uh, it's all the same. The general rule of thumb is you want to keep that split running central. If it's running central in the material, it's going to carry on going central. As soon as it runs off to one side, it's always going to run out on the thinner side. So that's what I'm watching for here. See, this side's a little bit thinner. So what I'm going to do is put more pressure on the fatter side, so this side here. So I bend that down, it brings the split back over to the center. And that's what I'm doing all the way down here. You're just monitoring that constant, little micro adjustments. And these bends are where you just want to keep an eye on it. After a while, you can get your eye in. I find this easier to do when I've cut the bark into thinner strips. If you've got a wide strip like that, it's difficult to keep even pressure over the full width of the bark, and you can find the split sort of be thicker on one side and thinner on the other. So it's always better to cut your strips out your thicker bark and then peel it like this and just slowly work all the way down. So would you process all the strips if, even if you weren't going to use them immediately? Um, or would you only process basically what you need? I usually just process what I need um, at the time. Um, if I'm going to make a batch of baskets, I'll process a load of material and have a big pile there ready to go that I can then cut to size. But to be honest with you, I usually leave the bark in big sheets until I'm ready to use it. It's kind of easier to store. Once you've got all these thin strips cut up, they actually become a bit of a nightmare to sort of store. Got a little bit of an issue bit there. 
Let's take my time around that. So, um, yeah, when you've got all these sort of strips, it, it can become quite tricky to just sort of keep everything nice and neat and organised. So I like to just use, you know, make, split what I need, cut what I need, and then make a basket with it. And just any off cuts, I'll, I'll, I'll put it into an off cut bag. So there's our two strips ready to go. Now I'll process the other bit, and then we can start measuring up and cutting the strips for our basket. Okay guys, so we've uh, processed all our material and you want to keep repeating that process uh, until you've got everything you need for your basket, okay? Um, when you're processing your ribbons, uh, your, your bark into these sort of strips and then you start cutting it out into the lengths uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you in a minute, this is an opportunity to kind of cut, cut round any defects in the bark if you've got any little knot holes or tears or anything like that. Just cut, cut them out. You don't want those in your basket. They're just kind of going to cause problems. Um, so yeah, at this point, that's the opportunity to kind of process and um, grade your bark as it were. So once you've done all that, you want to end up with, uh, so I'm going to reel off a list of measurements here. Um, you want to end up with nine strips at 17 and a half inches. Uh, then you want 12 strips at 15 and a half inches. You want one strip which is a little bit wider, three quarters of an inch wide than the other half inch wide, and that's uh, 15 and a half inches. Uh, that's going to be the part where th that the handle fits in, so you'll see that later. Then you want uh, five strips at 28 inches. These are going to be the ones that sort of help form the sides. And then you want another two strips at 28 inches, which are slightly wider, about five eighths, five eighths of an inch wide. And they're going to form the border. And then lastly, we want uh, about six strips, uh, quite narrow. These are cut to about an eighth of an inch. And they're going to form the three strand twine that goes around the base of the basket. And then also uh, they're going to be the part that lashes on the border at the end. So they're all the parts that you need for your basket. Now, usually at this point, um, I would have a handle ready to go uh, to, and I would just dive in and start making my basket. Um, but I want to show you guys how to turn this log into a handle. Um, so we'll run through that process now. And just to kind of recap then, so with all of these measurements listed out, obviously you have them in a lot more detail in your book, don't you? Yeah, they're all listed in the book uh, at the start of the chapter on how to make this basket. It's got the full list of all the tools that you need and all the measurements uh, for the bark that you're going to need for the basket. Um, the measurements are quite specific to make this type of basket. Um, you know, the handle's sort of measured to fit this basket. so. You sort of need everything else to be cut to the right measurement. Um, obviously, once you've got the process and you know how the techniques, you can then sort of experiment with, uh, you know, different sized baskets that you want to make. So you can make them really big or small or whatever. But um, yeah, to make this particular basket, you need to cut the, um, the bark to the measurements and that's all listed in the book. So this is the handle uh, we're going to be making. Uh, it's quite simple just to, um, you know, a bit of um, chestnut that's been bent round. Um, obviously, the, the handle needs to dry once it's been sort of steam bent uh, before you can fit it in your basket. So um, I've made this one uh, it's prepared for the basket we're going to make. Um, but I'm going to show you how to turn this log here um, into this small piece of wood there. Um, so. We've got a big bit of wood and we want to reduce the amount of wood really quickly. We don't want to be standing there with an axe carving, whittling down to a bit like that. It'll take us forever. So I'm just going to use kind of splitting techniques um, to, you know, I'm going to half this log, then I'm going to quarter it and then eighth it and then knock that down just really simply, very, very quickly. Um, I'm just going to half it with some wedges to start with. Um, so I'm just going to Scoring a line down the middle there. And again, all these techniques are in the book. 
and to split this out and bang it in a quarter angle there. Uh, it is possible to do this with axes. You need two axes, obviously. You get the beauty of chestnut is one of its properties is it splits really well. Uh, it's very easy to split. There we go. Nearly down, you see that line in there? That's the pith, so that's the first year's growth. So we've pretty much got that bang in half, so that's good. Uh, now I've split it in half, I'm gonna choose the cleanest half. So when you're choosing your wood for this, choose something nice and you know straight grained, not free. So I think this bit here is probably the, the cleanest bit. So I'm getting with my throw now, and I'm just gonna put that, and I'm gonna kinda of essentially divide this, split this bit in half. Remember when we were peeling the bark, splitting the thickness of the bark? We talked about that splitting techniques. Um, if I started trying to split this off, off centre, the split's gonna run out. So I wanna get that in half. Uh, let's bang that in. You can see the split's gone down there, lovely. I'll just leave it up. And then, I'm gonna come in, do exactly the same. Split that in half. I'm gonna lean on this side, which is the fatter side, otherwise the split will run out that way. There we go. Now, I'm not gonna split that in half, I think. I might be t pushing my luck a bit there if I try and split that in half. Um, shall I go for it? Yeah, let's go for it. So you're trying to control which way it basically Yeah, so I'm just watching that split now because this is quite critical. I could, you know, mess up my bit of wood here. So I'm just, there we go. There we go, that's quite nice. So you can see, you know, a couple of minutes, we've gone from a log to something that's, you know, getting near this kind of dimensions we want. Next thing I'm gonna do is just remove a bit of this wood here, um, just thin it down a little bit. So again, you just want to be careful here that you're not pushing your luck, especially here. If, I, if you imagine the split comes down and then runs out the front, that's going to ruin my piece of timber for my handle. So err on the side of caution here. You can always take a bit off. You can't put it back on. Lovely. So that, I would probably draw on the measurements of my handle and then I'm going to get on the shave horse with the draw knife and then take that down to my pretty much finished dimensions with the draw knife, which I'll show you now. So here's the bit of wood that I've just split out. Uh, I've shortened it, so I've cut it to about 47, um, 45 centimetres long and um, it's about three quarters of an inch wide. Um, now I'm gonna use a draw knife um, just to remove this excess wood and get down to my pencil lines here. Um, I've got a nice draw knife, uh, purpose made, but you can use a sheath knife to make a draw knife. If you haven't got one, they, they are quite expensive tools. Um, what I've done here is I've got a, um, a, a, a dry, stick with a knot in it and it's important that the, the wood's dry seasoned and then I banged my knife into the knot now if this was green wood so wet um, the knife would just split split the piece of wood so it's important that this is dead and it helps prevent it from splitting and then I've got a fairly pretty serviceable uh, draw knife there and I get my wood in the, um, in the shave horse 
and you can use that pretty effectively to get down to your pencil lines. A nice little backcountry technique for bodging a draw knife. And what I'm doing is I'm just trying to square this off so it's perpendicular to the face of the piece of wood because um, when we split it out it's kind of like a wedge shape so I'm just trying to remove that. Who needs to spend money on draw knives, eh? There we go, we're sort of down to our pencil lines pretty much there. Don't have to be bang on, it's just roughing it out. You can always tidy it up later. Now I need to mark in the side view of my handle. So that's the, the face, That's the, it's gonna bend over like that. So this is gonna be the width of it. And it's probably about a quarter of an inch, six mil, something like that. I'm going to mark that all the way down. Now, these end parts are going to be wider than this middle bit. Um, I'm going to make that a little bit thinner in there. But for now, I'm just going to remove all this waste wood. I could actually use my knife to sort of split that out, but um, I'm just going to draw a knife it out quick. Big for me, this uh, shave horse, <laughs> full stretch. <laughs> Sound like Rolf Harris there. <laughs> <laughs> he just died the other day, didn't he? Oh, did he die? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. It's like a bittersweet moment, isn't it, with that? Yeah. Pretty good. I'm not right on my line here, but I've kind of got down to the general sort of thickness. Um, I need to measure out these sort of end points parts. These are the bits that are going to have the little rebate in them that uh, the border gets woven around, which actually sort of holds the handle in the basket, and then that bit's tapered. So uh, I'm I'm going to use a tape measure and just measure those out a little bit more accurately uh, just because we need to get that right. Okay, I'll do that now. Now I've marked up my piece of wood uh, to finish carving out the handle. You can see on the existing handle here, we've got these um, funny ends. Uh, we've got this rebate here on both sides, which the border gets uh, wrapped in and then these tapered uh, tails that sort of actually get pushed into the weave of the basket. Um, all the measurements for this are in the book, um, so I won't, I won't run through them now. 
The other thing I've got to do is just reduce the width of the middle of the handle, which is the bit that's going to actually sort of form this arc, this bend. Uh, that needs to be thinner than these these bits here. So I'm just going to use a um, just a carving knife and, and just kind of slowly and carefully whittle those down. Uh, the way I do it is I'll just these are the bits that are going to be the start of that thinner bit. So I'm just going to make essentially a stop cut there and there on both sides just so if anything goes wrong um, that's kind of hopefully where any splits will finish okay right so I'm going to do that both sides and you can split quite a bit of it out so this is where if you've got any little wibbles or anything in your handle you know if any little sort of um, sort of deforms in where it's gone round things or in the wood you kind of want to follow those with the width of the handle um, so we want to get a nice even bend on this, uh, so we want the wood the same thickness all the way along. If it's got any sort of thicker bits, they're going to be stiffer um, and won't bend as easily as the rest of it, so you might get sort of flat portions to your handle. So just, just carefully whittling away. I'm working off the corners first rather than trying to work across the whole width of the piece of wood. I can work down to these lines a bit more accurately and just work in the corner. I've done that both sides. And you're sort of essentially left with a kind of a crown in the middle. You can sort of see the growth rings where the wood's thicker. So I can then just come in and take that thickness out across the whole width of the handle. Just being nice and careful, not being too brutal with it. down into sort of fine shaving now, just down the width, sort of see this kind of growth ring here, just kind of removing that lump there. There we go, nearly there. So there, we've kind of taken that middle section out all the way down, pretty even. Maybe a little bit more on that side, just check it over. Okay, a little bit more there. Cool, I'm happy with that, that bends pretty nicely. So now I'm just going to um, carve out these rebates here. Um, what I'm going to do is put a little saw cut in, stop cut there, and then a stop cut there. Um, and then I'm just going to get the knife in and just slowly chip those out. So I'll just get my saw and put those in. So I've got a nice little Japanese saw here, very fine cut. It's tiny little stop cuts. Just keep an eye on what you're doing here. It's easy to cut all the way through. 
to just, yeah, that's perfect. A little bit more down there. That's fine. Same on the other side. Lovely. So now I'm just going to come in with my knife and just leave that, that bit out. Take that lump out like that. That's probably all I need to do. The same on the other side. So you just primed it out then? Yeah, yeah. The wood will sort of split between those two stop cuts. Just get that bit out. Come on. Yeah, that's enough. You know, that's where the board is going to sit and it will wrap in there nicely. Now uh, I'm just going to taper these um, and just down to not a, a fine edge, but about a millimetre. And just take the corners off first. These are the bits that are going to get pushed down into the, in the inside of the weave of the basket. So just be careful when you're holding this and carving it. A piece of wood's quite delicate now, easy to break. Something like that. Same on the other side. good great so that's it really um, you know we've gone from log to blanked out handle in 20 minutes half an hour um, nice and simple all the work's done splitting tools it's getting rid of as much wood as possible really quickly and then you know just finish it off do all the fine carving with a knife um, you know flatten things off with the draw knife and then go in with the, uh, the little carving knife now what I'm going to do is um, get this in some boiling water for about half an hour, which is going to soften the wood down, make it nice and sort of plasticise it almost, make it nice and bendy. Uh, and then once that's been in the boiling water for about half an hour, we'll take it out, we'll get it in the jig, and then we can actually form it into our handle. So um, we'll get the water on onto the boil and we'll get the handle in there. Just one quick thing, hmm. uh, please, if we can, is at this stage you've made one handle and yeah. obviously you've still got other bits of uh, wood left yeah. over. Um, in your normal workflow, would you make more handles in, in one batch? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd blank out a load of handles, um, get them all to this sort of stage and then they're there for, you know, sort of bending really. I haven't got, I think I've got two forms, two jigs to bend them around, so uh, I wouldn't bend loads at once. I'd sort of bend a couple, let them dry, and then and then and bend the rest. But yeah, certainly you know use up all that log for getting as many handles as you can out of it. I'm going to put my uh, handle in the uh, steamer now, or well, boil it basically, uh, just to make it soft enough so we can bend it. Um, what I've got here is a fish poacher, which is big enough for my handle. Uh, if I'm doing quite a few, I'll, I'll load a, put a load in there at the same time. Uh, you don't need to buy one of these. Um, you know, you could just use a pan and use a bit of piping or something like that. Um, bung a towel in the end and some foil over the pan, get the pan of water boiling. The steam's gonna rise up through the pipe. Um, and yeah, just lay your piece of wood in there. Alternatively, if you can get like a jam pot or something that we were using earlier to soak the bark in, 
you know, essentially you just need to steam this bit across the middle. So you could just like lay the wood in, in one of those. Um, but yeah, these are, these are great. You know, they're nice and long. You can get these decent sized handles in. So the water's boiling now. I'm just gonna pop that in there. I've just put some wire mesh in there just to lift it out of the water and then pop the lid on. We're gonna leave that to steam for a good half an hour. Um, you can't really leave it too long, uh, but obviously if you don't leave it long enough and it's not soft enough, when you come to bend it around the form, uh, it's gonna break, okay? So uh, yeah, you know, if you're not sure, leave it a little bit longer. Um, but half an hour or so should be fine for that sort of size wood. That's quite a small piece of wood. So yeah, we'll leave that to um, steam and then we're gonna get on and start making the base of our basket. Now our handle's had its time. Um, so I'm gonna take it over to our jig and then we're gonna form it. Um, now, let's get it over there. We wanna do this quite quick. I don't wanna spend a lot of time. I don't wanna take this out and then have to faff around with it loads. The longer it starts cooling down really quickly and the cooler it gets, it loses that kind of ability to sort of stay bent. So the quicker we get it in the form, the better. And just uh, before we do that, is it, I think it's important to remind people that when it comes to this former, um, that you have all the measurements, etc., in your book. Yeah, yeah. So this is the former we've got, which is, um, you know, it's all measured out and laid out to fit the handle we're ma um, to fit the basket we're making, and these will all be um, in the book. All the measurements for those. So I've got my little pegs there that are going to hold it all in place. Um, extra jobbies there. So it's going to be hot, so I'm going to wear gloves. There it is. That's our supper sorted. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's not too bad. Right, so you can see how nicely that's bending round there. I'm going to get a peg that'll hold that side. Another one in there. Another one there. And obviously if there's a couple of you, it's good to work as a team for this. Now you just want to make sure this is nice and central. Yeah. These two bits need to be at the right level, which they're about right there. And I've just got these two extra pegs here, which just bend that last bit around a little bit more. And that just helps it um, stop sort of, spr it's going to spring back a certain amount towards um, straight so it's going to want to try and open up a little bit so if we just take it past the point we want it um, it's going to compensate. You know, compensate for that that sort of bit springing back um, so yeah that's about it that bent really nicely I and mean, chestnut does this really well um, it's got a nice arc um, everything's sort of fairly central we need to just snip the end off that one there but yeah, we'll leave that to dry. Uh, wait for it to be bone dry. Um, so probably, you know, it'll dry overnight. Um, if you're in, indoors, put it on a radiator or next to the boiler or in the airing cupboard, something like that, just to, you know, get it nice and dry. Leave it in the former until you're about to use it. And then, you know, once it's in the basket, it kind of, it can't spread out anymore. So um, yeah, now that's done we can uh, make our basket. So now the handle's all made, uh, ready to go, we can start weaving our basket. Um, we're gonna start by making the base. So we're gonna weave this area first. Um, got all my elements here. You'll notice this wider strip here, that's this bit. And that's the bit that the handle sits in, so we can have a nice wide handle. So that's why we have the three quarter inch strip in the middle. Now I'm gonna start with that. Then that's the 15 and a half inch and the 17 and a half inch here. All the measurements are in the book as a reminder, so you can get that and then, you know, they're all there for you. So I'm gonna lay the thick strip across the middle. 
one of these longer ones across the middle. Now here's the good point to get everything nice and central um, because obviously we've cut these to specific sizes. If we've got our strip over the, more over one way than the other, it's going to put our basket out. So just make sure everything's in the middle, which that is. And I'm just going to start by weaving these under, over, under, over, like so. So there's nine of these. You might notice there's different sort of surfaces, textures and patterns going on here. And you can use that as a design in your basket if you want to. that way and I'm going to come in with these. I'm going to stand up for this. And I'm just going to weave opposite to this thicker one so if they're under that they go over this one and they go under that. Now when I'm doing this I fold the one that's going under up like that and I push that weaver down and then bring that over and it helps you get the weave nice and tight, yeah? That one's in there. This one needs to go over that. And once you've got a couple of these in, everything locks together, stops jiggling around. to just double check that everything's central. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm now going to put six of these on this side, six of them on that side. So I'll just carry on with that. And again, it's all opposite to the one before it. So this was under there, it's going to go over this one. Like that airplane sketch under over <laughs> overdone. <laughs> so it's something we did touch on briefly earlier, but in terms of your workflow, do you basically have all the pieces ready before you begin the weaving? Yeah. Um, Certainly for a basket like this, which is sort of fairly prescriptive, um, I'm a real planner. I like to have everything ready, ready to go um, when I'm about to start. Because for me, there's nothing worse than having to stop halfway through weaving a basket and prepare another bit. So uh, I think it just helps with, you know, you can just sit down, get right into it and just um, speeds you up as well, you know, you, you sort of work through these baskets quite quick once you get all the bits together. My wife, she's she's the opposite, she'll, she likes to just sort of create stuff, so she'll have no end point in sight when she starts, and she'll just sort of see what comes out, which, you know, has its benefits. I don't think something's not central there. Let's just pull these through. So I've found that cedar bark does shrink a little bit more than, say, um, sorry, chestnut bark. 
does shrink a little bit more than cedar bark. So when you weave with cedar bark, and you do it nice and tight like this weave is, it will probably, you know, if you've soaked it just enough, it will dry and not really shrink that much. Chestnut will shrink a little bit more, so you will get a few gaps appearing in your weave, but as long as we haven't over soaked it, it won't be too bad. All the time I'm just trying to scrunch everything up, get it all nice and tight. One, two, three, four, five, one more this side. Six, lovely. So we turn it around and we'll work this side. So you're now just going to repeat everything to complete the other side? Yep, do another six the other side and then that will be the base formed and then we can look at the next stage which is kind of bending up the upright. Okay, we've made our base um, and it's ready to do the sides of our basket. Um, before I've done that, I've just re-soaked uh, the, the bark a little bit. Um, it was starting to get a little bit, sort of, a little bit dry. And you can see here, I've kind of pre-bent, pre-folded all these uprights um, down the line of the basket. Now, you need the bark to be nice and supple to do that. Otherwise, if it's too dry, they're just going to break um, and you'll have to remake them. So just a, you know, literally 10, 20 seconds in some hot water and it just softens them all up again. And then you can pre-fold them, which is what I've done. Now, this is also a good time to decide what's going to be the inside and what's going to be the outside of your basket. Um, because obviously once we start bending these up, decisions made. So I've just looked at the bark. I put most of the sort of textured stuff which is the kind of bit just under the outer bark on the inside and then our outside of our basket is going to be this cleaner uh, nice sort of clean layer which is the generally the layer right next to the wood or the layer that we've split open uh, when we were splitting out the thickness of the bark so that decision made got our um, bark nice and soft and the next thing I've done is just softened our three lengths of uh, quite thin one, in, one eighth wide pieces of bark. And they're going to form this twining around the bottom. Uh, now the reason why I put this in uh, is because it, once you twine around a basket, it actually holds all the uprights in place. Um, it, it stops them kind of wanting to fold out. If you just went straight into this weave here, straight from the base, it takes you three layers of that before everything's trapped in and upright. Okay, so it's quite a faff. You've got loads of pegs everywhere and all the rest of it. So just by putting in this um, twining, um, three strand twining, it's just a really good, simple, quick way of locking the basket in the position you want it. Um, if you've done any willow basketry, um, this is basically what they call in willow basketry a three rod whale. Okay, it's exactly the same technique. So if you know that, that's what we're going to do. But um, in this sort of basketry, we call it twining. So don't ask me why, but that's the way we do it. So the way I'm going to start is I'm going to start on this side just because it's close to me. I'm going to start that down near one corner. And each piece is just going to go in f behind an element like that and upright. So inside it'll look like though that. 
just a bit of tail sticking on the inside of the basket. We'll trim those off later. Now it's going to be a bit of everything everywhere to start with, but do bear with. Once you get a few weaves in, it, it does hold together. So I'm always going to be working from this, this left hand one, okay? It's always going to be the one on the left that does the manoeuvre. And what it's going to do is it's going to go in front of two uprights, so one, two, and then behind one. So I'm going to bring it behind that one and then back out to the front again. Okay, so in front of two and behind one. And then I take the one on the left, which is this one, and that is going to go in front of two, one, two, and then behind this one and bring it back out to the front. And you can see those are trapped and they're nice and upright. Then this one on the left, in front of two, one, two, and back out to the front, behind this one. Okay. Do trust me, this looks a bit tricky, but it's actually not too bad. So one on the left, in front of two, one, two, behind one, and back out to the front. And I'm just gonna continue like that, all the way around the basket, the two rows like we've got there. And while you're doing it, once you get round once, everything will be locked in position and you can just go around again and manipulate stuff so it's all where you want it. Everything's all standing upright properly. left, in front of two, behind one. And when you get to the corner, you just need to pay a little bit of special attention just to make sure you're getting it right. So this is going in front of two and then it's behind that one which turns the corner. This one is going to go in front of this one and that one there and it's behind that one and out to the front. And make sure when you're doing the corner you don't sort of pull it in too tight. Just keep it nice and square. Give the bark enough room. And this one in front of two, and we've turned the corner nicely there, behind that one, down to the front, and carry on. And again, we'll have full sort of diagrams of this method in the book. So if it looks really complicated here, it's nice and easy to follow. Uh, when you've got a diagram in front of you of what, you, what you're meant to be doing. I'm getting in a tangle here. Okay, put the two. And now you're going to carry that on all the way around? Yep, I'll go around uh, 
back to the beginning and then I'm going to carry on and do a second row um, and then two rows will be enough and I'll just the second row I'll stop where the first row started um, and then that should be everything locked in position um, and then we can move on to the next technique. Now I've uh, taken my twining round, I'm onto the second row now and I've just got two more sides to get until I'm back to the beginning. Uh, but I just want to show you a technique for adding in weavers. Uh, you may, I've cut these short just to show the technique, but you may, you know, not have enough to go round twice. Uh, now it's really easy to do. Um, basically all you're going to do, I've got my three here that I'm going to add in, is the one at the front, I'm just going to place a weaver behind there, like so. And that's wedged behind one upright? Yeah, yep. so it's just wedged in with that weaver, um, that bit of bark that we're twining with. And then I'm going to take the one at the left and just wrap him over like that. And then that's locked in there. That's that piece locked in. That can be discarded and then we carry on with this long piece, yeah? And then I get onto this next one. I place a weaver behind there. So it matches up with that one. And I take our bit on the left, bring him around there. And then that's that one locked in. Now the last bit goes behind the one we've just used. And now, rather than that, I discard that one and I carry on with our long, long one we've just added in. And that's all of them added in. And carry on with that one. And that's the last one we added in. So, so you can see we've got our three new ones that we've added in. These are the three that we've discarded, they were too short. And I'll come in at the end and just trim all that off. But for now, I'm just going to carry on until I get back to the start and then we're finished on the twining. I've just come back round to our beginning bit and just coming up to finish this second row. So I just wanted to show you that quick. Uh, so I've just come around this corner and you can see our weaving on our first row started here. So I'm just going to take this second row and what I don't want to do is kind of step up onto the next row. I want to otherwise that's going to create a lump in our basket. I just want to finish it so it finishes in line with where our second row started. So let's take that around there. I think one more and that'll do. Like so. That's it. And then I'm just going to trim these off. So you're stopping just before the... Just, you can sort of see where the first row started here. Mm -hmm. Then we stepped up to do our second row. And then this second row has come back round. And then it just sort of, when these are trimmed off, it will just blend in with this second row here. Right. So you stop off literally at the last. Yeah. I mean, I might actually even take that one out. I think that would be better. Yeah, like so. I'll trim those off so they're kind of workable, so they're not flapping around. So just for now, leave them like that. And that gives us a nice, what will be a flat, sort of, when that's sort of squidged down. 
nice flat sort of surface to weave. But you can see with the twining how it's got all the uprights standing upright now. Um, everything's in position where we want it for uh, weaving the sides of our basket, which is going to be the next stage. Um, it's worth just going around and just manipulating everything, making sure it's where you want it at this point. And remember, if things start drying out, you can hear the tops of the basket starting to get a bit dry. Before I start weaving the sides, um, I'll, I'll dunk this in boiling water again and just get everything softened down. Um, won't take long to soak, literally probably just dunk it in for five, ten seconds, and then take it out and then it's, it's flexible enough for the next bit that I need to do. Okay, um, we've got our twining in. I'm going to start uh, weaving the sides, um, so this layer's here. Um, we're going to use what's called a twill weave, which is nice and simple, um, and it's going to create the sides nice and quick. So we've got our long, uh, I think they're 28 inch uh, bits of bark here, and they're going, to, they're going to create the sides. So I'm going to start on one of the long sides, again near the corner, and I'm just going to put the end behind a couple of uprights. Now the twill weave basically goes over two, behind two, over two, behind two. Okay, So it's going over this one, this one and this one, and then it's going behind two. So over two, behind two, and then carry on. So over those next two and then behind those two. Okay, over two, behind two, over two, behind two. And then we come to the corner. Now what I like to do with my baskets is take them from a sort of square base. You can see the squared corner there. And then by the time we get to the border, we've got a sort of nice sort of oval shape. So what I'm gonna do on this first row at the corner is I'm just going to crease it ever so slightly just to help create that corner. And I'll do that all the way around on this first layer. But on the second layer and third layer I won't bother creasing it, I'll just let the basket slowly sort of form into a circle rather than being sort of square edged. Uh, right, so behind two there, so going over these next two. I mean, you can, if you want, go under, over every single one. So over one, under one, over one, under one. But um, there's no real need to. It does make a tighter weave on your basket. But So that's the corner there. So I'm just going to crease that bit of bark like that. And just help square that corner off a little bit. So over these next two. And behind them. Over two. Behind two, over two, behind two, and you can see how quickly we're sort of getting round here. Corner, just going to crease it, over two, behind two. And be careful on the corners that you don't pull it, because it can sort of pull your basket in, like so, okay. Just make sure it's got enough room for all the uprights to have their own space. Over two, behind two, over two, just crease that corner. And then we come back to the beginning. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to bring it in front of that one. Just make sure we're nice on that corner. And I'm just going to carry on sort of overlapping our beginning again so it's trapped behind that one and then what I'll do in the end is come in and just trim that there so it's that ends behind that upright and that's our first layer in so I'll come in to do our second layer rather than starting 
on this side again. I'm going to start on the other side, just so we don't get this doubling up of bark all on one side, because it can just give like a bulky bulge on one side. So I'm going to turn the basket 180 degrees, and I'm going to start here. Now, to create its uh, twill weave, to give this kind of herringbone effect, you can see this sort of stepped effect here. I'm just going to offset where I start by one. So I'm going to come in, uh, I want to go over to there, behind two here. So I'm going to start here, like so. You can see to over two, and then I've sort of stepped up, moved one to the right, and I'll go over two, behind two. Behind two. you can kind of see. Now don't worry about all these gaps here. Once we've got the next row in, we can just kind of manipulate the basket and get it all nice and tight um, and sit in exactly where we want it. But for now, we'll just get the weaving in. Now I come to the corner. Um, I'm not going to crease the bark. I'm just going to let it sort of flow around that corner. And that'll start turning the basket, sort of bringing the wrap turn it from square into a round, which is quite a nice, nice little finish to the basket. And again around the corner. Right, now we're back to the beginning again, so I bring it behind there in front of our tail and then just overlap it like so. And then this bit here will trim off in there. So we've got a second layer in. So I'm going to put another two layers in, so I'll bring it round, twist, turn it 180 degrees, come around to the side for a third layer. And uh, it's good. so you're now going the opposite, starting on the opposite side from. Yeah, so this was the side we started initially for the first row. Then I turned it round and then I started here for the second row. Turn it round again, start here for the third row. So we'll have two ends starting on this side, two ends starting on the other side. And let's go there. So offsetting again. Front of two and uh, behind two. And you can see this twill weave, it starts creating the, the, the sides really quickly. And we're back to the beginning. So over two and just overlap it there. Bring it around to there. 
So that's our third layer in. So I'm going to turn my basket 180 degrees and I'll put the fourth and final row in. It's going to go there like so. So beginning on our fourth layer and just overlap it a couple of times. Yeah, to the front, brilliant. And that's our everything in place. So now I'm just going to go round. You can see I'm just sort of pushing the layers down with my fingertips, nails, sort of scrunching it all nice and tight. You can see how much they're sort of moving down. Filling those gaps, sliding it down. Great. So that's that. That's the sides done. Doesn't take long at all. Um, now we're just ready to fit the handle and put the border on. And I'll show you that next. Hi guys. So we're on day two now of our basket. Um, it's the morning of the second day. And um, we're just going to come up to do the border on the basket. Uh, but before we get into that, I uh, just want to talk about a few things. Um, this is the handle that we carved out yesterday and it's in its jig. Um, I decided to use this handle on there because it's had a day to sort of stay formed in the jig. I'll take it out of the jig. There we go. And you can kind of see if I let go of one side, you can see how it's trying to open up there. But um, it's held its shape pretty well and I'm just going to use that. Once it's in the basket, it's going to be woven into position and uh, that's just going to help it set in that shape. So I'm going to go ahead and use that. Just one quick thing before you continue, Nick. Yeah. Typically, how would you normally leave that to kind of dry for? Um, well, it depends where you got it. You know, if it's somewhere quite warm, um, it should dry a lot quicker um, than it has done out here. But um, Ideally you want it so it's dry enough so when you do take out the jig there's not much of that kind of opening out of there. It might open out a touch but you know it's that sort of size but um, yeah so it's not it, it should be sort of set into shape it should dry and, and set in that shape um, but I'm going to go ahead and use that. Um, before I start my border and fit in the handle um, it's one of those parts of the basket where once you're committed, you kind of have to see it through to the end because once the handle's in there, it starts getting awkward to re-soak stuff and you just want to make sure you've got everything ready. Uh, so I'll just run through all the, the components that I've got um, before I start. So the main basket, I've re-soaked uh, just the, the top of it, so I've upside down in the, in the hot water just to soak the bits that I'm going to be working. Um, so all these uprights are going to end up being folded down like so um, over the, 
the element that you see we're going to put in. So they need to be nice and flexible. If they're not, if they're not soaked and they're dry, when you bend them around, they're going to break and snap. Okay, so that's really important. Then I've got my three elements, which are going to create uh, the actual wrapping on the border. So you'll see there's two different sizes going on here. This bit here is going to be essentially the core. So that will be going in and out on, um, behind and in front each one of these uprights. And that creates um, the, the part that I then fold the uprights over. So they'll fold over that. Um, and that's the core. And then I've got two other parts which are going to wrap around the inside of that and then the outside of that. So if you imagine they're going to sandwich that and all the folded uprights. Now these two pieces are slightly wider than our element there. You can see that. These are about five eighths. Um, this is about half an inch. The reason for that is when the border dries, um, these elements, remember when we talked about it earlier, it, the, the bark will shrink in its width and its thickness. And if these parts that are covering this bit are the same size, when this shrinks, you'll get to see like parts of the border folded under and it just looks a bit untidy. So if you make these just an eighth of an inch wider, a little bit wider, a couple of mil, something like that, two, three mil, um, as they shrink, they're not going to shrink enough to show the workings under the border. So it just keeps everything nice and neat. So that's those bits. And then the last part I've got is a load of thin uh, 1 8 2 3 mil binding material. And that's what I'm going to use to actually wrap uh, the border onto the basket and round the handle to just kind of secure everything. Um, there's a couple of, well, a, a tool that I'm going to use. So it's basically a pokey thing because I'm going to have to sort of get in between the weaving uh, to thread our, our, our binding material. So I've got two bits here. I've got an chain, old chainsaw file uh, and the handle end that gets jammed in a handle has got a sort of point to it. So that can be quite a, you know, something that people might have knocking about uh, that you can use to kind of poke through the weave to help you get uh, the binding through. I make these which are just old tent pegs and then I just file down the end to a kind of a blunt screwdriver point, essentially a flat-headed screwdriver point, um, which is kind of rounded off a bit. I found this like actually a little bit better than the chainsaw file. I don't know why it works better, but it just seems to. Um, you could use a small screwdriver. Um, I found the problem with those though is they've got quite sort of very, very square machined edges, and that can actually sort of damage the bark as you're sort of trying to weave through, uh, kind of poke through. So maybe if you've got an old flat-headed screwdriver, you could just round it off a bit, just make those edges a little bit kinder for your for your bark. But um, yeah, essentially we want a tool to poke through the weave. Um, I've just got a knife, pair of scissors, and lots of pegs, lots of clothes pegs, because to start with, when I start getting all this on my basket, uh, I've got to, got to peg it all into position. Um, there's going to be a lot of elements there and everything's going to be trying, trying to ping off and undo. So lots of pegs, just peg the hell out of it, keep everything nice and in position. And then as you start binding round, you're just removing the pegs and uh, yeah, it'll slowly sort itself out. But lots of pegs. So first thing I need to do is I'm going to put in um, this core, okay, and that is going to go I'm going to start round on my basket here, and I'm just going to go, I'll turn it under over each one of these, so not following that twill weave that we did yesterday. And this is just so I can bend these uprights over it. And I think this is also an opportunity to remind everyone watching that <clears throat> that this, especially at this final stage of the process, if things do get confusing, that's where your book comes into play. Yeah, it's all in the book and there'll be lots of diagrams in there, um, which can be a lot more clearer than seeing me actually with hands all over the place. Um, and the, the method that I'm using to secure all this in place and bind it all on. 
and it can just be a lot easier to have a book there with a the page open to refer to rather than having to keep rewinding and fast forwarding the video with me blethering on. Before I did this, when I just re-soaked the basket, it's a good opportunity, you know, now the basket had rested overnight and it dried out a little bit. Some of these, you know, side weaves have dried a little bit and they will have done a little bit of shrinking. It's a good opportunity to re-pack all that weaving down again like we did at the end of um, when we put, first put it in. But, you know, there was a few sort of one, two mil gaps and you can just pack all that weave down, get it nice and tight. So once you put the border in, that's it. You can't really do any more alterations on the basket. So just before you do it, that's the opportunity to just get everything nice and tight and where you want it. So just coming back round, nearly there to the beginning again. Um, at the beginning, so I'm just going to, as we did earlier, just overlap a couple and then leave that sticking out. And I'm just going to go around and just check that it's all in position and everything's how I want it. I'm just pressing on the inside of the basket, pressing out, which is just going to make sure that weave's nice and tight with the shape of the basket. Okay, I'm happy with all that. So I'm now going to put my handle in. So we've got our tapered ends. And they're going to fit down inside the weave here. So I'm just going to come inside of that weaver that I just, that element that I just put in. And I'll do one side at a time. It's going to be a little bit fiddly. So I'm just going to open up the weave slide that handle in, come on the other side and just be careful you don't break your handle there we go, it's in it's all trapped inside that side it's there and push that side down a little bit more now this should be measured up so that that element that we just put in is in line with that rebate. I don't know if you can see that, but this element here is in line with this rebate. Now when we put the wrapping that goes on the inside of the basket, that's going to go inside that rebate. And that's going to secure the handle to the basket. Making double sure everything's nice and tight and where I want it. Take your time on this. You can feel like you've got to rush, 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 but yeah, you've just got to make sure it's all good. Okay. So now I'm going to start folding over all these uprights. Now you can see here this weaver's trying to push it up. So there's a gap there. I want to push that right down into the weave. And then I'm going to fold each upright. So that one's going to go over to the inside. This one's going to come over to the outside and you can see they'll sort of naturally go where you want them to. I'm just creasing them here. I'm going to come in and secure it all in a minute so don't worry if they all ping out and open up. I'm 
Now the one by the handle, I'm just going to leave that, I'm going to bind over it and then I'll just snip it flush when I've finished the basket. Slowly working my way around, just making sure that's all nice and packed down. Once it's all creased, I'll then come back in and peg in my the, this material here to start sandwiching the border together. So all those uprights have been folded down now, you can see they're all trying to ping out of place, but this is where I'm going to come in uh, with this wider part. I'm going to peg that around on the inside first, then I'll come in and do the other bit, peg that around on the outside. So what I want to do here is I'm, I'm starting to think about where I'm going to start binding, lashing all this uh, border together. So I need to think about where the start, the join is on this bit. Now I'm going to put it at the end of one of my baskets. I don't want it around the handle. So what I want to do is when I come round to the handle part, I want that to be a nice secure binding. I don't want any sort of starting and stopping of the binding. So I'm just going to start it all and stop it all on this end of the basket. So I'm going to bring that in there. Now this isn't going to look pretty for a bit until it's all secured. So all the bits that are folding in, mm. That's what you're pressing down on? Yeah. With this? So okay. this is going to trap all those folded down ends. I'll get a peg and just secure that. Don't worry if it's not nice and neat and accurate to start with. We can sort all that out once it's all secure in place. And there. The peg. With basketry, border doing the border on a basket is always the it's always the final act, and it's always the bit that can really it just really makes the basket. You know, up until then it might just like look a bit ragged and bits everywhere, and you've got all the you know the snag ends that you haven't trimmed off and all the rest of it. But once you get the border on, and then it's all secure and the basket's finished, and you can trim everything off, it's just uh, you know it makes everything come together. So don't worry if your basket looks a bit ragged at this point because it will smarten up lovely once we've got the border in place. So you can see here I'm being fairly rough about how this is all positioned. You know, I just want to get it in there. You can see there's a lot going on so I just want to secure it and just control it and then I can go in and sort it all out in a minute. That's, so that's that's the start of the bit I started with and that's the bit wrapping around. Now that's quite a long overlap. I don't want that much of an overlap. So once I've got that where I want it, I'm gonna snip a lot of that off even before I start binding it on and you'll see why in a minute. So I'm then gonna come in with our bit for the outside. Um, you can see here I've got two different sides, two different colours, so I'm just going to use this um, slightly darker colour to um, just add a bit of contrast against the rest of the basket. And this bit is, I'm going to start and stop it in the same place as I did my inside. You see that? And I'll just use that peg, peg it on. And then I'm trapping all those uprights that were folding round the inside, or the outside, sorry. And trapping all those in. So the only one you leave upright is the one that meets the handle? Yep. That's because um, I can't fold that. I could fold it back round there, but you know, essentially I'm just 
just trimming it off so it's hidden inside that board a bit will be fine. Um, I'll show you where the handle's sort of secured in a minute once I've got all this in place. Again, there's that wide piece for where the handle is. I'll just snip that off. So back round to the start. Back up round. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna Pull the basket from the inside and hopefully this is going to kind of stretch out those bits that I've just put in just get them in a, in a better position and now I've got a, a, a much better idea about you know where this is going to start and stop so my overlap I don't know I've gone about sort of what's that five seven centimeters two three inches of overlap so I'm just going to snip that off and again here I'm just going to snip that off there and I'm going to re-trim those obviously when I've uh, bound the basket together but for now that's good. Now you can see on the inside, see here that strip that we pegged around on the inside is trapped in our little rebate of the handle and that's what's actually going to secure the handle in place once it's all bound there that won't be able to slide out once it's all snug and on this side I'm just going to push the handle in a little bit more and just get that one in position nicely so you can see that's all nice and trapped in there so next thing I'm going to do is because this weaver is slightly wider than everything else I just need to push it up so we can get in above that weaver in there okay that's important because um, that's the part I'm going to be binding through and around. Okay, now It's going to make these stick up a bit from the rest of the basket, but two things are going to happen. One, which is what I spoke about just now, uh, the bark's going to shrink in its width, so they will reduce a little bit. But also as we bind it on, it's going to kind of close them up over the top of the rim of the basket. So just help kind of tidy all that off and give it a bit of a a neater finish around there. Right. So when I start my binding, uh, you might think the first thing you want to do is actually bind where these all join. Uh, now that's not what I do. I start my binding just to the right. I'm going to work that way, uh, so anti-clockwise or to the right. I'm going to start my binding here and I'm going to leave the joins right to the very end okay if I started binding the joins right from the get-go that kind of fixes it all in place and I've got no opportunity to kind of rejig things or reposition stuff and you can see around here you know the, there's a bit of slack there that's probably not in the right position so I want to by by not binding those joints, as I weave round, I can sort of position everything and get everything nice and tight and where I want it. And then by the time I come round to where these joints are, the rest of the basket's done, I can bind those up and it's all locked and in, in the right, right place. I've just noticed here this weaver's popped out, so I'm just gonna pull him down. Right, so I'm ready to bind. So I'm just gonna start here that's where our joins end and start here. So I've got my thin elements. It's worth having a few of these spares cut ready to go. Um, these are going to be doing quite a bit of squeezing through little gaps and they can shred and they can get damaged and they can snap. Um, so have a few in spare and I'm just going to taper the end, make it a bit of a point 
because um, that's going to be doing a lot of poking. Now I'm going to start, I just choose anywhere, um, I'm going to start here and I'm just going to try and wheedle in between the weave there. I don't want to be poking, puncturing the bark, I just want to be opening up the weave of the bark. Okay. Now I'm going to poke him through, give it a long tail. Now this tail I'm just going to bring round and then up through the inside of that border so that's trapped in there like that, okay? And when I come to the end, I can snip that off. So now, I'm going to come across diagonally. So diagonally up and over in between those two uprights. And then I'm going to bring it out to the right of that second upright, okay? So I'm going to get in with my tool, make me hole. This is where it can get fun. And a bit fiddly, so I'm just going to point this end. So I find making a hole and then just bring that weaver in to follow the tool brings it through. And just guide it through nice and gently. Make sure there's no twists. And then I've just folded that up, hold it with my finger nice and tight, bring that around and then tighten that up. Okay, and that's our first binding. Now I'll come around to do the second one. So one, two, so I'm just to the inside that peg, so just in. Where is it? It's in. So this is why it's handy having your bark nice and soft because you can poke around and maneuver it and manipulate it a bit. And you can see here that's starting to shred there. Now it's going to be a bit of an issue. I'll see how far I can get, but I reckon by the time I get to there, I'm just going to have to snip that off. But we'll work with it for now. But that's good. It should be able to show me an opportunity, give me an opportunity to show you how to add in. You can see as I pull it through, it's sort of shredded off. So again, bring that weaver up. Put your finger on it, nice and tight. Make sure everything's not twisting around. Come on. And then just position it and then you can get it nice and snug and tight. Now take that peg off. So I'm going to come in and this will bring me out next to our handle. Again, bring it up, press it down with your finger nice and tight, and tighten up that back side. What you want on this bit is you want the border, you can see here that border's kind of folded over as they're bound around. Ideally, you want it sort of pinching together like that one, so I'm just going to slide my tool up there and just. That's better, that's a bit neater. Now, now I've come to my handle area. I'm not going to skip two uprights because that would bring me over there. I'm actually going to bind the handle as if it was one thing and then just come out in the space next to it again. It's just to really secure our handle in place. And this is going to put the weave out uh, or the stitching out. It'll, it'll offset it by one but that doesn't matter. As long as the handle's secure, that's the important point. So again, just push that up, secure it with your thumb, pull the binding through, and just make sure they meet nicely. Okay, and that's our handle bound on on that side. Now I'm just going to go back to missing two uprights and going into the next one. If 
if I can find the gap in the weave. There it is. It's in there somewhere. There it is. Just take extra special care that you're not by accident puncturing through any of the weaving. Uh, it's much better to just to try and separate it out and go for the gaps. So basically you'll continue this all the way around? Yeah, I'm going to continue all the way around and as I go we should, you know, all these sort of gappy areas sort of bring that in, tighten it up and it's going to, you know, manoeuvre this end positions. Do the same thing on this handle area, so wherever I finish I'll stitch so I'm right next to the handle and then bind over right next to the handle, come out the other side and then carry on. But yeah, essentially just continue round and then I'll show you how to finish it off. So I've got round, most of the way round the basket, about halfway round, a little bit more. And you can see here we've bound in quite nicely, we've got the handle in there, we're just working around this side. Now I'm just looking as we start coming round to finish the basket off. My binding material, you can see it's starting to get quite frayed there. Uh, there's a bit of a weak point starting. Um, and also, just sort of looking around, I don't think, you know, as this has got to do a lot of travel, I don't think this is going to be long enough also to, to get back round to my end. And I want to make sure I've got a bit of a tail here so I can pull it through and finish the basket off. So rather than risking this either snapping there or running out when I really need it to be uh, working its best on this join, I'm just going to cut it here and add in a new one. Now I could, because I've got my handle as well, I want to make sure I've got a nice secure binding around the handle. So I could carry this on and wait until after the handle and then add in a new one there. But then that brings me close to this join. Okay, and I just want to make sure that when I get to this join everything's nice and secure um, and obviously where you're starting and stopping these is always a bit of a weak point. So rather than any taking any of those risks it's much better just to cut your losses nice and early. So I've got a few wraps before I get into my handle here and I'm just going to trim that off. I'm not just going to trim it really short and I'm just going to, it's come out through the weave and I'm just going to poke it so he comes out through the top of the basket and I can pull that tight okay now I've got my other bit here which I'm going to use just going to blunt the end point the end of it and this bit I'm going to just poke him underneath where the other one came out pull up a tail and this bit I'm going to fold up the inside of the border so again all this is going to be in the book so all these diagrams will be there showing you how to do these little techniques so I've got those two ends like that and that's just going to give me a nice secure spot part starting point to start binding this okay and then I'll come in at the end and trim those off and once that's dried that's going to be dried in position that'll be fine so that's how you start and stop and add in. Now I'm just going to carry on binding around here and then uh, once I get back to this finishing bit I'll, uh, I'll show you that bit. Right we're coming into the last last little bit here. Uh, I'm all the way around to the beginning. I've just got that little bit section to do now. Everything's starting to dry up a little bit so I'm going to um, need to get this finished. Now I've come round to this bit um, I just want to, you can see how the border it's all gathered up and all the slack's been taken out of these areas and I just want to make sure that by the time I get to this bit 
you know there's no bulges like that or you know this inside bits not cutting any corners kind of thing it's all nice and flush and tight up against the basket you can see there I just need to push that around a bit because once that's bound on that's it we're done and then I'm going to come round and sort of finish it as we did our where we started and stopped that area I'm going to finish it in the same way here so I've just got this stitch here which is going to start binding everything together over Now it should, everything should start getting quite tight at this point and a little bit more tricky to get through the weave. You just have to be a little bit more patient, a little bit more forgiving with it all. I've gone in the wrong one there. harder to grab and pinch. There we go. Keep that peg on there, I think. And this one's going to come out here. This looks like a bit of a wrestling match going on with the basket, but it's just difficult to get everything in the right position with enough hands and whatnot ready to grab everything. So you've just got to go with whatever position is comfortable. Okay, so that's the inside bit bound on. And that bit there, I'm going to trim that off. I'll show you how to trim that. Um, so I'm just coming around to the beginning. So you can see here our, our weaving is not going to match up, but that's because we've done funny manoeuvres around the handle, but that's okay as long as it is all secure, that's the important thing. Right, so that's that bit in. So with the last weave, that has to come outwards. Right, so what I'm going to do here is bring this over and then bind it round there and then I'm going to take it through and under this bit which I'll show you here so it's coming out underneath that starting point and then I'm going to feed that up inside the border. Up there. And then at the top like so. And that's our finish. Okay. So that's it. That's uh, the basket all sort of bound together, all secured. Come together nicely. Yeah, I'm really happy with that. It's all nice and straight and level. And what we're what we're aiming for, if you look at the top there, that sort of shape, it's kind of like an oval. Um, now, it may not be quite the shape you want it. It might be a bit square, you know, a bit squonk over one side or something like that. But because this is still a little bit flexible, you can just manipulate the basket. You know, manipulate that border you know, position it where you want it and then just leave it and then once it's sort of dried and set that's the position it will stay in, okay. So all we've got left to do now is um, trim off all these these tails, these tail ends and then the basket's done. So to trim it off um, a good pair of scissors, good pair of sharp scissors certainly for these inside bits. These scissors are uh, a bit too long and cumbersome for getting in there. You can trim them off, but um, I'm not going to be able to trim it all very flush. But I'm I'll do as much as I can with these scissors. Um, so these uprights, just make sure you're not damaging any of the other elements of the basket. So I'm going to pull these up and then trim them. And then as they dry, they'll sort of just drop 
back inside, they'll just shrink that little bit inside there. So this bit here, which is the end of our border, I'm not going to trim it straight, I'm just going to trim it at an angle. So it just kind of matches up with that bit of weaving. It doesn't have to be right snug up against it. It can actually look quite nice if you just do it outside like so. Nice and neat. And then I'm going to go around and all these uprights that have been bent down, I'm going to pull them so I'm actually pulling on that quite hard and then snip it. And then as it retracts, it should hopefully bind, um, go up inside your border. It's just super careful here not to actually cut any of this binding because that's always a little bit depressing. So pull it nice and tight and snip it nice and tight. Snip. And as you're doing this, this is a conversation we had briefly off camera, Nick, and mm. that is. Um, you were talking about obviously supplying to craft in general, but mm. taking the time with the finishing and the refinement um, really makes the end product that much better. Yeah, you know, it's all these little details, trimming it neatly, um, hiding all the cut ends if you can. You know, it makes a, makes a big difference. Um, you know, if you're gonna start selling them or whatever, these are the things that are gonna mark you out from other people. And it's just a, you know, even if you're not, it's just a, a level of care and, you know, neatness that's nice to bring to these crafts. So these two, this is where we're joined in. So again, just pulling them up nice and tight. Snip them close and then they'll just shrink back down and be hidden. These are the uprights next to our handle. So... I'm going to pull that up as much as I can and then snip him off nice and close so he's hidden down in there. This is our twining. Now this is important with the twining. If I snip that very flush in here, that's where it's poking through. That's actually going to sort of make, this, make it weak and it could work its way loose back through the weaving. So I'm just going to leave that a little bit long. I'll just cut it at an angle like that. Okay. And then just sort of sit like that, which is fine. Okay. Sort of fairly flush with the rest of the basket. Now these are our tails from our side weaving. So treat those exactly the same as you would the uprights. Scissors on. The best for this job, so pull them nice and tight, pull it, pull it, pull it. And then that end will just sneak back in inside the weave. My wife's got this really nice pair of um, green handled, very short, very pointed, very sturdy snips. And uh, I couldn't find them to nick them for this weekend, so I think she's hidden them from me. That's all the uprights done on the outside. Just trim this here. Pull, pull, pull. A couple on this side. And this is when the basket starts really kind of emerging. You know, you've got all these snag ends. And you just trim everything off and it sort of declutters. Makes the basket look nice and Nice and neat, this up right here. Pull that tight. Now for the inside, uh, it's going to be a little bit harder. These big scissors. Let's see if I can get away with the knife. Uh, difficult to do this and show it on camera. But I'm going to pull that up use the knife and then just gently cut. Pull that tight. My sharp knife. Pull it nice and tight. So be careful we're not cutting our binding.
So I'm on just on the last, cutting the last upright on the middle here, on the inside, and just snip that off. And that's it, and the basket is finished. So is this where you give it a final once over if it needs any final shaping? And yeah, as I said, you can still manipulate uh, the shape of the rim, but apart from that, that's kind of it. You know, you, you, any sort of other work you should have done sort of before you fitted the rim. Um, the last thing I will do is once it's completely dried, uh, which could take a day or two, um, is all these kind of hairy bits. You can see here all these little threads of bark fibres. Um, I'll just go over it with a, a lighter uh, and just fizzle those off um, and just, you know, gently run a lighter around it, which will just get rid of all those little hairy bits and uh, give it a nice finish. But I might actually, you know, neaten this, smarten up the handle a bit, just sandpaper the inside of that. We've got some pencil lines there. You could have obviously done that before you fitted it. Um, but yeah, just sort of sand that down a little bit, just take away some of those um, those marks. But apart from that, it's pretty much done. And I'm really happy with that. Nice little, it's really sturdy, beautiful little basket, ready for gathering your autumn harvest. So there you have it my friends, that is a wrap for this video. Nick McMillan, thank you so much. Been a pleasure mate, nice one. Pleasure has been all mine. It's fantastic to see the process in its entirety with your good self. Um, so to kind of wrap up on a few things, as Nick just mentioned, uh, as we began the second segment of the video, we've actually been filming this over two days. There's a lot of work involved behind the scenes, the logistics, etc. The one thing we have been grateful for is the weather at the time of filming has been, yeah, it's been awesome. glorious. Yeah, really cool. um, so up until this point that we've been filming the past few months, there's been very lot of rain in the UK, heavy winds, etc. So we've been absolutely blessed with the weather. But yeah, we filmed this over a period of two days um, because there is a lot of work involved in this kind of project. Project. Would I be right in saying that you know, when you're teaching this particular course in person, it's, it's like a really intensive one day or two days or how? No, the, the, the chestnut basket course that we do uh, to make this basket is over two days. It's over two days. Yeah, because we can have up to like 10 students on it. Right. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of work and um, it would be too much. It wouldn't be enjoyable to right. squeeze it all into a day. And typically when you're teaching Pretty this, much. is it ironically what we showed here like from the, the harvesting to processing and etc the depends um, usually on whether we can get access to chestnut um, mm -hmm. in the past I've done both so certainly the chestnut bark we've um, actually just gone into places with the prepared bark ready to cut and split and whatnot right um, other times we have done it in the woodland where we've harvested the bark as well Right. And then showing them the whole process. It just depends on what sort of setup we can get going. Um, the cedar bark course that we run, we do generally run that in the woodland. Right. Harvest the bark as part of the course. That's the three day course. So we'll take the bark, prepare all that on day one. Day two and day three are weaving different types of bark. So it's quite an immersive experience then. The cedar bark course is, yeah, it's lovely. It's, yeah. Yeah, really good course. So. As I've mentioned at the very, very beginning of this video, a few things. Uh, number one is video has been timestamped. Obviously, this is a very long video, but as Nick's just alluded to, if you were to learn this in person, it's over a period of two or three days. So we try the absolute best to condense that information into this video, leaving no stone unturned. And as I mentioned, the various sections have been marked out into different chapters. So if you scroll along on the timeline on the bottom of this video, you see the different chapters marked out. And also in the description below, all the sections are marked out. And on the left hand side of that, you will see the times. And if you click on that, like I said, YouTube has a very cool feature. The video will jump straight to that section. So that's in order to help you as an ongoing guide and reference when you're watching this video moving forward, because the encouragement is obviously done responsibly in terms of how you source the material, is to have a go yourself. And another thing that we've also mentioned at the beginning that this video is essentially an accompaniment to next book. 
<laughs> okay, and as we kind of outlined before, Nick has done all the illustrations himself. He's painstakingly worked on this for many months now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And kind of making sure it has all the information that you're going to need, uh, uh, centered around this topic and this particular basket uh, that we've covered in this video. So it will mean the world to me. I ask you to follow. I don't ask for much on my channel. I don't even ask for subscriptions, right? But if you gain any value from this video whatsoever, to head over to the link that will be in the description below and pinned to the top of the comments to grab yourself a copy of the book to Nick. It also supports him as a maker. He does this full time. Um, and listen, he doesn't have to show this on video. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful that Nick has allowed me into his space and to share this information. So it goes out there to a wider audience and it will mean the world to me. Like I said, if you gain any value from this video whatsoever, to head over and grab yourself a copy of the book. And the book together with this video are a perfect partnership in terms of helping you understand this kind of project in a lot more detail. And finally, what I'm gonna do is put a link below to Nick's Instagram. You can go over there, check out the plethora of work that he gets up to. So it's not just the basketry, but he's a phenomenal illustrator uh, painted natural objects uh, and his work is absolutely pristine being shown in galleries yeah uh, yeah london galleries uh got it in linley's in belgravia um the mole galleries uh have done quite a few open exhibitions there um so yeah get yeah there. so all his uh, instagram profile will show that in a lot more detail and on his website uh, when you go when i link to uh, the book on that website you can explore everything else he has going on on his website um Actually, and, and we can wrap up on this. On the website, obviously people, people can find out about the work you do in general, mm -hmm. but when it comes to specifically the baskets, obviously they, they have the ability to grab themselves a copy of the book, mm -hmm. um, but also you do sell pretty much all the baskets you make, don't you? I do, uh, I make them to commission. Um, the ones that I, I make um, for this sort of purpose, I'll probably, uh, there's a place called Maker's Barn near Petworth in um, Sussex and that's a kind of a nice outlet for craft. So I put most of the ones I make in there. But, um, you know, I, I've made baskets for um, people in Vancouver and um, Australia. I sort of ship worldwide. So, you know, if you want to commission me, more than welcome to make them and, and ship them out to you. Yeah. Perfect. And uh, people, you can contact Nick through his website um, for any questions or queries you may have. Um, and on that note, before we wrap up the video, are there any final words from you in terms of what you've shown on this video and how it relates to the audience that is watching? Um, I just hope it inspires you. Uh, you know, basketry is a, a very ancient craft and um, I just hope this has sort of shown that, you know, you can go out and use uh, lots of different types of fibres and materials. You know, this, this designer basket, it's made with flat weaving material, so, you know, potentially you could use any other type of flat weaving material. It doesn't have to be chestnut bark. Um, you could use willow bark. Uh, you could use cattails. You could, you know, all these sort of different fibers. So, you know, get out there and experiment. And actually, just remind me, sorry, one quick thing is, when it comes to the courses you and your wife run, mm. uh, we spoke off camera, and I think it's worth mentioning on camera, like the breakdown of the kind of basketry related courses that you guys run. Yeah, so we do kind of three really. There's the sweet chestnut course, which is kind of making this style of basket. Uh, there's the cedar bark course, which we just briefly spoke about. It's a three day course. Uh, usually around the sort of uh, end of April, start of May, uh, where we spend three days in a woodland setting, um, harvesting the materials and then making baskets with that material. Um, my wife also runs uh, a more broader kind of, uh, she calls it focus on fibres. So it's touching on all the different types of natural fibres available to weave with. So, you know, it's everything from tree barks to plant fibres. Um, and that she generally goes out, that's run from our home, and she'll go out in the, the local village and countryside and harvest materials from ponds and hedgerows and bring it all back and then show people how to sort of prepare those, all those different materials and then actually what kind of, you know, um, weaving techniques you can use them for. Oh, wow. And that's usually uh, middle of June, I think, that, that course. Perfect. Yeah. So what I'm going to do, guys, links to everything below. And as a final recap, the, this video has been broken down into chapters. You can check that out in the description below. And I'm going to put a link to uh, Nick's book, this is, which is an accompaniment to his video, um, his Instagram. I'm also going to put a link to the courses 
that people can find out more about. Um, and on that website, you can obviously contact Nick if you've got any questions regarding commissions uh, and so forth. And lastly, what I'm gonna do is also put a link to the previous series of videos that I filmmed with uh, Nick. And that was covering a similar thing, but we've done it with Cedar. Bar. Yeah, it was a more broader look at cedar bark, yeah. wasn't it? So we actually, a small basket. Yeah, so we did it this video as, as one, and that one we broke into three sections from the harvesting, processing, and the actual weaving. Yeah, um, and there is a book that accompanies that as well, a little a, downloadable book um, about cedar bark as well. Yeah, uh, uh, and that book has been very well received as well as the videos, so links to everything down below. And as a final wrap, like I said, if you gain any value from this video whatsoever, please do go check out Nick's Instagram, give him a follow, and also grab yourself a copy of the book. You're supporting his work and also the fact that he's allowed me to document his process that he's refined over many many years so that you may learn and that inspires you so nick a sincere thank you once again oh, it's been an absolute pleasure mate pleasure has been all mine yeah. and guys i really do hope you enjoyed this video and i appreciate you watching if you watched all the way up until this kind of last segment i really do appreciate that like i said we really hope you enjoy this video and gain some insight no matter what part of the journey you're on when it comes to exploring the outdoors and natural materials and by the way when you see the smoke coming <laughs> we've got the fire right next to us so there's not some guy sitting next to us with like <laughs> chain smoking right so this is the uh, uh the, the fire that's kind of burning next to us where we cooked our bro breakfast just earlier on so guys like i said really do appreciate you watching links to everything down below sincere thank you once again nick so guys as always i shall see you on the next installment of z outdoors and until then i hope whatever you're doing you have a blessed day a blessed week ahead from nick mcmillan and myself z outdoors peace out <laughs>